1981 to 1983 is a time I return to pretty often on this channel as a 99er, fond of looking back on the system's glory days. And in light of that, it just feels right that the topic I've decided to tackle here is a company that entered into the video game market in mid-1981, and for the most part, departed it at the end of 1983. The way Imagix and TI's fate seemed intertwined, at least chronologically, wasn't lost on at least one commentator of this period, with the Creative Computing interviewee in February 1984 saying, Look at Imagix and TI. In four years or less, they went from nothing in the home industry to huge suppliers and back to virtually nothing again. But today I don't mean to focus on the nothing. I want to talk about the something and the special something that Imagic contributed to the gaming world during its early years. And I want to talk about the contribution they made in turn to the TI-99 4A game library through that. There's quite a bit to talk about as far as that goes, so today I'm just going to address the company's initial successes and their first contribution to the TI-99 4A library through that. Later videos will cover later history and contributions, but we'll have to settle for that today. The Imagic story really begins at Atari in 80 and 81, when designers like Rob Fulop, Bob Smith, and Dennis Koble are getting increasingly frustrated with Atari's taking their work for granted and not sharing profits with their designers. Notoriously, after finishing his hugely successful VCS Missile Command port, a design the 2600 really doesn't make easy. Philip received as a bonus for his invaluable work for the company a coupon for a turkey at Safeway. Which falls a bit short as far as profit sharing mechanisms go, I figure. And anyway, he felt that way. <laughs> so by summer 81, Philip, Smith, and Coble had all left Atari. Together with Bill Grubb, also from Atari, and with the addition of a complement of developers from Mattel, they founded Imagic on July 17th, 1981, with an initial staff of nine. So Imagic is born as a company with a strong complement of both Intellivision and VCS developers, who can consequently play to both of those systems very different strengths. And it needs to be said, at the time they do this, the idea of an independent game development house, without any vendor affiliation, or even a single targeted platform, is fairly new. Activision had been the first to make a big splash with this approach, and Atari's attempt to sue the concept out of existence there had been ultimately unsuccessful, thank God. And that opened a path forward for companies like Imagic. So, a big thank you to Atari for distributing its industry-leading game system so that games could be developed for it, and for pissing off its industry-leading developers so that they could go on to do better things. The Magic's first hit comes in its initial cohort of games, all for the VCS, and those are Star Voyager, Demon Attack, and Trickshot. Star Voyager is a serviceable space shooter, but nothing really new or newsworthy in a relatively busy genre at the time. Trickshot is a very playable, rather fun billiards game, which does a really good job at that for what that's worth. But Demon Attack, on the other hand, is a smash hit. A fixed shooter with a design that's just different enough to stand out and make a magic a household name. This being the situation, the only game of the first three that matters to anyone who isn't an Atari 2600 fan is Demon Attack. Star Voyager and Trickshot were never ported to any other systems. Whereas Demon Attack was ported to just about every system of the 81 to 83 era, including TI-99 4A. Heck, it was even ported to Odyssey 2. And credit to that version for getting the essentials right on limited hardware. But for me, the projectile does feel a little bit too slow there. As for the Intellivision port, it's generally well regarded both for its graphics and for its fast action. I find it quite fun. As I'd mentioned, the magic from the get-go was bringing both Atari and Mattel talent to the table, so it makes sense that while the VCS version makes the most of that system, the Intellivision version makes the most of that very different system's tile-based graphics. Or, I guess, card-based graphics in its own nomenclature. In keeping with the Magic's Intellivision focus, this early era also features Intellivision-only releases of Beauty and the Beast, Dracula, and Swords and Serpents to take advantage of that system's, as I say, very different capabilities. But Imagic kept on releasing its titles for VCS and Demon Attack remained their killer app. 
In September 1982, Analog reported, Imagic, hot on the heels of demon attack as announced, Sphinx, they mean Riddle of the Sphinx, Cosmic Arc, Atlantis, and Firefighter. Only some of those made it to non-Atari systems, and generally for good reason, it seems to me. Atlantis is the most successful, widely ported, and easily portable to never get a TI-99-4A port out of this cohort. Like Demon Attack, it even gets an Odyssey 2 version, but I'd say the omission from their eventual contribution to the TI-99 library is pretty understandable. It's a relatively simple single-screen shooter whose aesthetic appeal mostly consists in Atari 2600 rainbow power, or that is to say scanline graphics. There's not much benefit and actually some downside to putting it on a more powerful tile-based graphics architecture, so skipping a ColecoVision or TI-99 for a port, both of which they did, kind of makes sense. And giving those systems games which actually benefit from their hardware does make sense as well, which they did. Cosmic Arc likewise sees no ports to more powerful hardware, but it's very much a VCS product by design, so it makes sense it stayed one with the game having been bizarrely built around exploitation of a bug which generates graphical artifacts on that hardware, kind of resembling a star field if you squint right. Riddle of the Sphinx, on the other hand, as an adventure game, could certainly have taken advantage of more powerful hardware. And Firefighter's gameplay could have been implemented on just about anything, I figure. But probably nobody perceived demand for these lesser lights of Imagic's early days by the time they were expanding to other platforms and working on plenty of newer titles. In any case, late 82 was a good time to be Imagic or to be playing its games. Still, a hypersaturated market and sky-high expectations were an issue. This was the year that gave gamers Pitfall and Demon Attack on the one hand, but elsewhere it was the year that gave gamers VCS Pac-Man and E.T. the Extraterrestrial. But don't get me wrong, the news was mostly good for Magic. In November 1982, Electronic Fun, for example, asks with respect to Star Voyager, Can games go platinum? And answers their own question. It looks that way. Just two months after beginning its first delivery, Magic has shipped its one millionth cartridge. And in December, Video Games Magazine reports, the software company Imagic, which was started by a group of former Atari and Mattel employees, will ship somewhere in the vicinity of $50 million worth of cartridges in 1982. So, that doesn't sound so bad. Still, the market as a whole took a hit upon Atari's reporting below expected earnings in November. Beyond the downturn in the market hitting the whole of the game industry at the time, November had one further bit of bad news that seemed tailor-made to ruin Imagic's month. And that struck straight at the heart of their growing empire. That came when Atari succumbed to its classic of all else fails Sue outlook on business and sued Imagic, alleging a suspicious similarity between Imagic's demon attack and Atari's own Phoenix. That battle was eventually settled quietly out of court in mid-1983, but it loomed as a direct threat by Atari to Imagic's strongest asset of the period, and surely would have scared a few investors during a period when Imagic was looking into an IPO. So in the end, what came to the TI-99 foray out of Imagic's 1982 Golden Age, in which their first cohort of VCS and Intellivision carts were released? Initially, just one of these titles got a TI-99 foray translation, and as I'd mentioned, that's Demon Attack. And it didn't happen right away. Word of Imagic taking an interest in non-Atari computer ports of Imagic games first came in January 1983 at Winter CES. A Demon Attack port for VIC-20 was promoted there in addition to an already promised port for Atari computers. But though they were expanding their already impressive reach, a reach incidentally that motivated Creative Computing to give them a Games in Most Formats award in March, TI-99 wasn't yet in a Magic platform. Word of a TI-99 foray translation of Demon Attack, and a whole lot else besides, instead came out at Summer CES 1983, over a year after the original Demon Attack started making news. In June 1983, word tore up the TI world that Imagic and TI were joining forces. The International 99.4 Users Group reports in its CES news piece that, at a June 4 press conference held by Imagic, 
It was announced TI and Imagic had signed a joint agreement for a minimum of seven modules for a 994A, with Demon Attack and Microsurgeon named there. Word of these titles makes it into the Pittsburgh Users Group newsletter in July's CES report and many more, and 99er features its own CES report and the Imagic announcement in its July issue. So Imagic was finally working on a Demon Attack for TI-99? Well, no. All indications are the port was farmed out. The port, which TI would ultimately rename Super Demon Attack, is attributed in its manual to Smith Western Games Design Group. That's not an established name as written, but Bill Gaskell posits in Collecting Cartridges for the TI-99 for a Home Computer that this was J. Smith of Western Technologies, Inc. His two companies often get grouped as Smith Engineering Western Technologies, hence Smith Western, mentioned here. Members of the community have pointed out a commonality between the TI-99 Demon Attack and the unreleased prototype of SNK's Lasso, which appear to further speak to that relationship, namely the common graphical assets shared between the title screens of Lasso and Demon Attack, which reflect their common origin but also just reflecting the fact that you can't go wasting pattern data in an age of graph paper pattern design. So how does it play? Well, it's complicated. See, I'm going to admit I'm an ardent and irrational defender of this game, because the big beautiful multicolor enemies and their interesting patterns really captivated me. Plus, I've never been all that good at video games and never really aspired to be, so, in giving me a few levels of exciting, visually impressive action, it gave me something I was satisfied with. That having said, the caveats are these. First, firing is only possible when not moving the cannon, so play requires an oddly herky-jerky style where you stop moving intermittently to fire. Consequently, it can make sense to just hold down fire and treat the act of releasing the movement keys as your de facto firing action, since that way, when you're not actually moving, you fire. The game working this way isn't actually game-breaking in any way as I see it. It's a playable mechanic, but many folks will find it annoying for sure, and unusual at least. Second, the planet background is pretty, and I'm glad it's there, but on the other hand, it does interfere with tracking enemy fire and the ship itself. Notice how the ship's placed above the planet, so it doesn't interfere with gameplay in the Intellivision version. Yeah, I think they got it right the first time there. Third, I feel like the projectile moves at a reasonable speed, and having only one of them permitted on screen at a time is consistent with how the 2600 and Intellivision versions work, but they don't seem to have had the chance to balance difficulty based on the weapon's firing rate. Enemies at the demon base eventually are just produced faster than it's possible to shoot, uh, and they cannot be dodged. So the foundational mechanics are fine, but it doesn't seem like the game got tweaked properly to work with them, which is too bad. As far as accuracy goes, broadly speaking, there's just no way to critique the game usefully as I see it, given a Magic Zone 2600 and Intellivision versions differ greatly from one another. Imagic built their empire, brief as it was, on making the most of the unique capabilities of these systems, so it would seem kind of dumb to take their game and try to turn TI-99 4A into a VCS for the sake of it. That's exactly the sort of thing they didn't do. But one thing I guess you could say isn't accurate about this version, and yeah, really, I just don't care, is the enemies. They don't resemble the enemies in the other versions at all, really. But again, that's fine with me. They're big and colorful and have interesting motion. I think they're pretty great. A downside to the complex designs used is there's no way to split the enemies in the way the enemies separate in the 2600 version. You can't split an enemy into two smaller versions of itself if it has complex bilateral symmetry. The Intellivision version gets around this by making one of the enemies just two identical sprites stuck together, which sees to be stuck together when shot. Doesn't really add much that way and seems kind of lazy, so I'm fine with just leaving that out completely. The TI-99 4A version clearly takes more from the Intellivision version, but firing mechanics on the other hand are more similar to the 2600 version. 
in the Intellivision version, shots track with the position of the ship, and they don't in the TI-99 port, which is fine, since the way it was done is what most people will be used to and expecting. One final complaint, they took the voice synth out of the game. And I don't mean the voice synth in other versions of it, neither the Intellivision nor Odyssey 2 versions support those systems voice synth add-ons. No, I mean the voice synth in this version. A beta of the game survives in which great voice synth is present. It plays identically otherwise, but has fantastic alien voices. Some of my favorite on the system. Alas, absent from my final production cart. Maybe someone needs to make a repro. Well, for all the criticisms, I really like this game. I like its sprites, I like its enemy movement, I like the huge, weird demon base. But also, why is it Dracula? Anyway, I like the voice synth and the beta version too. But I understand if folks looking for a real arcade challenge don't love Super Demon Attack. My enjoyment of it is based on the fact that I can jump in, play ten lazy minutes, and thoroughly enjoy the experience. If I were determined to be the world's greatest demon master, yeah, the lack of long-term challenge or endgame fairness would be a definite issue. But what can I say, under the circumstances, it isn't an issue for me. And it gives me that casual fun. I'll leave off looking at a magic's history and contributions there today, but there's a lot more to be discussed since that joint TI a Magic Summer CES 83 announcement I'd mentioned involved three more titles, and I'll be looking at those and somewhat darker days for a Magic and the TI 99 in coming videos. Thanks for watching, folks.